Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. During the 2020 COVID lockdown, Netflix became a refuge for both parents and their children to gather discovered new and instantly beloved characters like Enola Holmes. Her creator, iconic Edgar Award-winning fantasy pioneer Nancy Springer, joins us today to talk about Enola, Rowan Hood, Mordred, Morgan Le Fay, Jamie Bridger, and other memorable characters and worlds from her singular catalog. Ms. Springer, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much for taking out time to be on the show. First, congratulations on the runaway success of the Enola Holmes film adaptation on Netflix. That's so exciting that so many kids and their parents are watching and falling in love with her together. Take us back to the first time you ever did in your own mind when she first knocked on the door. It, it's interesting. Sherlock Holmes is so real to people, and I think he's the only fictional character. I was trying to think of another, like Tarzan maybe, or uh, Count Dracula. But no, uh, when I gave him a sister, which to my knowledge, he did not have before I gave him one. Um, people would come up to me and say, did he really have a kid sister? And uh, she's as real as he is. He's fictitious. And he has spawned a, a dynasty of uh, fiction characters based on him and his, his, his group. Anyway, the idea for Enola Holmes this is terribly pragmatic. People they think there's this big romantic uh, process that went into this. But actually what happened is that my longtime editor called me. Uh, I had done some King Arthur stuff for him. I am Mordred and I am Morgan Le Fay. I had done the Rowan Hood series for him. Rowan Hood is Robin Hood's daughter. And he called me and he said, what I want you to do next. I'm like, yeah, like I'm going to listen to you. But what I want you to do next is something set in deepest, darkest London at the time of Jack the Ripper. And um, no, uh, I don't do historical, I don't do Jack the Ripper. He's saying, I would have you do Jack the Ripper, except I already have somebody else doing Jack the Ripper. Well, thank goodness. And there he left it. And I knew this guy had absolute genius for trends for what was marketable. So I'm like, okay, okay, I'll give it some thought. I read about King Arthur when I was a kid, my mother's books. And I, re I read about Robin Hood when I was a kid and I wrote Robin Hood. What did I read when I was a kid? Deepest, darkest London, time of Jack, Sherlock Holmes. And thus instantly Enola Holmes was born. I knew right away what her name was. And I pretty much knew all about her right away. Basically, she's me. We first meet Enola Holmes on the page in The Case of the Missing Marquette. And you wove old and new Sherlock Holmes history and the new world he was existing in now brilliantly together, especially with the new direction that you wanted to take him relative to Enola. Please talk a bit about that balance. Well, I, I, I love Sherlock Holmes. And when I was a kid, I remember reading, my mom had the whole set. Uh, and I remember when I was about 10 or 12 years old being heartbroken because I had memorized all of them and there were no more. But as I grew older, I became acutely aware that Sherlock Holmes didn't have a high opinion of women in general. And I thought, uh, see, I have two older brothers, uh, five and seven years older than I am. And I know what a kid sister can do to older brothers. So I thought it would serve him damn right if he had a kid sister that could run rings around him and take him down a peg. And the reason she can do this is because he ignores everything that has to do with women's culture. He doesn't understand the language of flowers. He doesn't realize that there's a language of postage stamps. He doesn't get that there's a language of handkerchiefs. He doesn't understand the language of fans. He doesn't understand any of the ladylike conspiracies that flourished underneath the patriarchy of Great Britain, Great Britain at the time. So he had it coming to him. Would you volunteer a funny example of that from the early books in the series? I think the funniest example was maybe in the, when she catches him in the ditch. That's, I guess, the third book. Oh, I don't know which book it is. I don't know anymore. But uh, I think the funniest, funnest example was taking the corset which is a symbol of repressed, straight-laced femininity and turning it into armor, uh, weaponry, 
baggage and uh, Enola couldn't do without it. It is her, totally her disguise. It takes her skinny, I was skinny at one point or another, believe it or not. Uh, it takes her skinny personage and turns it into an hourglass figure. And that entire hourglass is filled with stuff she needs to get away with stuff. In books that follow, like The Case of the Left-Handed Lady and The Case of the Bizarre Bouquets, what did it look and feel like when you were writing in the investigative headspace of the Holmes? These books were tremendously difficult to write. Uh, mostly because I've always been a seat of the pantser, and these ones are very plot bound. Uh, there's three plots, the plot of Enola eluding her brothers. In each book, there's three plots that I had to braid together. Enola eluding her brothers, uh, Enola finding a missing person, and Enola uh, hunting for her mother or seeking her mother or wishing that she had a good and proper mother. Uh, and... Uh, as far as the instinct for figuring things out, honestly, I don't know where that came from. I really don't. That's, I, I always swore that I would never in my life write mystery. And the first time I knew I was writing mystery was when I won an Edgar Award for something that I was not aware was mystery. And uh, I had written that as a, uh, it's called Toughing It. And I had written it as a reluctant reader book. And in order to catch the attention of the readers, I had murdered somebody off in the first page. And uh, I was writing it from the point of view of a grieving brother. My daughter, who was my first reader at the time, she was about 16, said, mom, you need to solve the mystery, solve the mystery. I'm like, no, no, I, I don't need to solve the mystery. And what I finally did was called my brother, Benjamin, who is, or was at one point or another a policeman and has taught law enforcement classes. And I asked him who did it and he told me and I put it in. So whatever this is, I don't come by it naturally. I think the bizarre bouquets just was a total romp because having her fall through the roof of a greenhouse into a big grave of asparagus was, it was just surreal. And, you know, oh, well, that was before you let, the, you let the rats eat my face. In books like The Case of the Peculiar Pink Fan, The Case of the Cryptic Crinoline, and The Case of the Gypsy Goodbye, we grow with Enola from 15 in the first book on into womanhood through those books. How did you make decisions in terms of pacing her age? And why did you feel like 15 was the right age to start with? Once I had, uh, once the editor told me to write this, and I'm like, I've got to write, I've got to write mystery, I've got to write historical, I have to do research. I never did historical and tons of research and tons and tons and tons of research. And once I had done all that research, which took maybe two years, uh, I was going to write zillions of Enola Holmes books. I was going to write like 15 or 20 of them. And it was going to be that kind of series where you started the same place over and over again, that, that sort of a Nancy Drew type of thing, maybe. She insisted on having a character arc. She wouldn't let me get away with it. She insisted on growing and changing, and she insisted on coming into a right relationship with her brothers, and she insisted on closure about her mother. So I only lasted six books, and I was upset with her, but that was the way it was. How collaborative is the tongue-twisting titling process for these books between you and the publisher? Oh, the Gypsy, Goodbye, they've changed the title. Apparently, Gypsies are not politically correct. So it is going to be from here on the case of the disappearing duchess or in foreign language, you know, the title's not copyrighted. They can change the title. And in foreign languages, they often do change the title. So these books go by various titles around the world. Would you give viewers and fans a look inside how you visualized Enola and company during the writing of this series? For instance, did you do character sketches with different fashions and styles of the times to fit with different scenes? And uh, yes, I'm extremely visual as a writer. This is what I did for research for Enola. One of the things I uh, cut these, well, I had a costume book and I took photocopies from it and cut them out and colored them and pasted them onto sheets of paper that went up around my office there. That's better. And then there was the, 
Victorian paper dolls uh, and the Victorian coloring book. One more, yeah, there's, there's Enola's room. And the Victorian street life. Thank goodness, thank goodness for uh, Dover publications. Yeah. And my everything book. Let's see if I can find a good page. Uh, just looking, oh, whatever. Yeah, visual. I don't know where I got that circular picture, but it's uh, kind of amazing. It's amazing that you're sharing so much with viewers and fans about how your process works in the writing room. Thank you so much again. Is this basically Enola's ongoing source book that you keep adding to with new volumes in her story? Language of Flowers. And this whole thing, I'm still going. I mean, I found this at a thrift shop. I was volunteering and I grabbed, but that's how far, that's how far we are and still going. It is so Enola. It is, you know, it's perfect. I started out in a standard three ring notebook, but when I saw that, I knew it all had to go in there and it did. That'll be worth a million bucks at auction one day. When you finally got word that Enola was heading to the big screen, how skeptical were you that she'd actually make it there? So many people we talk to that start out with a book series that get optioned, it never quite always gets there. Some do, but some don't. It was purely amazing. Now, as you said, it was a long time coming. Throughout my career, I've sold film options and nothing ever came of them. And I was beginning to get a bit cynical. This whole thing was very different. It wasn't Netflix to start with, by the way. It was, uh, it was legendary. Uh, and it was supposed to be a feature film in the theaters. But uh, it all started actually not up with the CEO of a, of a film company, but with a little girl named Millie Bobby Brown. She read the Sherlock, I'm sorry, she read the Enola Holmes books. She liked them. Actually, her older sister, Paige, read them first and passed them on. And then Millie Bobby Brown, who was right, I think, just about at the peak of her success in Stranger Things, said, I want to do these as a movie, and it's going to be my first starring role in a feature film, and it's going to be in movie theaters, and we're going to have a premiere, and all the rest of it. It was her idea. She's the producer. And she, at the age of 16, played the leading role. So, so she is the phenomenon there. I'm, I'm just like, the first contact my agent had was from Millie Bobby Brown's father. And uh, after a while down the road, all I was told at first was that there was a young actress with the uh, prestige who was who is interested. And after a while, I learned a little bit more and a little bit more. And finally, as I said, Legendary picked it up. And uh, I got to go to London and meet Millie, give her a big hug and uh, meet some of the other actors and see some of the filming. And it was one of the foremost experiences of my life. That was in the summer of 2019. Uh, then, of course, came COVID. So uh, the the movie couldn't be released. Uh, it was in limbo and then Netflix blessedly picked it up. And it's been enormously successful on Netflix because of Netflix, I think, and, and because of COVID and everybody's needing something lighthearted and larky to watch at the height of COVID. Um, I've had the re most remarkable luck, incredible good luck. In the wake of the film's success, with so many new viewers and readers falling in love with Enola, now that you're working on her again, with Enola Holmes and the Black Baroche, what can readers and fans expect in this reunion? In a sense, it's the next one. In a, in a, in a better sense, maybe it's the first of the next batch. Um, it's when Enola Holmes is working with Sherlock, whether he wants her to or not, in the Black Baroche. Wow. How much fun are you having with that? Oh my gosh, it's hilarious. It's, it's one of the best things I've ever done. Here's the book. 
she has hired a, a horse and carriage because they wouldn't didn't have a bicycle for rent. Okay. Off we went. Jessie, or did the man perhaps mean Jessie? Jessie took matters into her own hands, or perhaps I should say onto her own hoof, stepping out immediately at a brisk trot, even though I tightened the reins. Luckily, we were headed in the proper direction, and almost before I knew it, we were out of Dorking, speeding down a country road like a, like a whirly gig, of course. The gig's high wheels whizzed over the rutted road, their motion and the height of my perch making me feel quite dizzy. I hauled harder on the reins, trying to slow down the mare, but her only response was to arch her neck, quite prettily, I admit, and clip-clop more smartly, lifting her feet like a hackney. Folk working in their cottage gardens gaped as we flashed past. I am sure that Jessie and the gig and I made quite a picturesque sight in the bucolic setting, but I have failed to appreciate the artistic effect, not with my hat coming loose and the horse foaming at the mouth so that bits of spume flew back into my face like white butterflies of the Ullo men. Jessie showed every sign of wanting to break into a gallop, and if she did, she would surely land us in a ditch. Were you drawing on any real life experience with horses in the course of riding that kind of scene? I've been a horseback rider and uh, though I've never driven horses, but I can understand the perversity of horses. Before you began beguiling readers with your own original characters and worlds, who did the same for you as a child when you first began to discover books? Oh, there were a bazillion books in the house and I have no idea where they came from because I don't recall seeing a single bookstore during my childhood. They must have all been collected by my parents before they were married or since they were married. Uh, my mom was 40 when she had me. Uh, she and my dad were around 30 when they got married. So they both had uh, long, long-ish lives in which to collect their own stuff and books. I just thought books came with the house. I, sort of like ladders and, and hammers. And why did my get, dad get so upset when I left them outside? Um, books were, they were like water. They were, they were like food. They, you, you had to have books. I didn't understand people who didn't have books. And I was absolutely free to read anything. Nobody was bending over me and saying, oh, that's too old for you. Or uh, it just absolutely flummoxed me the first time a parent was buying a book from me at a uh, store signing and said, now, are there any bad words in this? I'm like, they're all, they're all good. There's no such thing as bad words. Bad contexts, maybe, or bad interpretations. Uh, that's one thing about that novel I mentioned before, Tuffing it, the one that won the first Edgar. Uh, it had a lot of bad words in it because that was one really angry, angry kid. And for that reason, it was uh, censored. I've been censored. I've been censored all over the place. That is one of the one of the ways I know I'm pretty good. So was it a predetermined path for you? Did you know right away as a child you wanted to be a writer when you grew up? No, it, it didn't happen that way. And uh, I, I never formed any thought of being a writer when I was young. Uh, I never formed any thought about what I was going to be whatsoever, because back then I was born in 1948. So I was raised during the 50s and early 60s. And back then you were going to be, if you were a bright girl, you were going to be a teacher or a librarian. And that was pretty. And of course, you were going to college to earn your MRS. That was the sole purpose. And uh, I'm sorry, but that's the way it was. Every girl was going to be a beautician, a secretary, a nurse or a teacher, I, I might've missed one or two, but that was, that was pretty much it. The, the choices were very limited. I went to uh, Gettysburg High School in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, there were a lot of intelligent kids in my class because, because of Gettysburg College, Gettysburg Seminary, because Gettysburg was the county seat, because of the Civil War, Gettysburg being a historical place. And Every single one of the girls in my high school class became a teacher except the other librarian and me. Every single one in my in that academic court, in that academic class. We were tracked back then. So I, I maybe my books really are 
based not on uh, goals. The way I wrote, the way I started to write had nothing to do with goals and it had everything to do with emotional needs. I wrote because I had to. I actually, in, in college, I was an English lit major, but that was far enough back so that the only female author we studied was Jane Austen. All that I wrote, all that I studied were male authors. And when I, I mean, all that I read, obviously. And uh, when I knew that I wanted to take all these surplus entirely too many, too dramatic, too vivid daydreams that had been in me since I was a teenager. When I knew I wanted to take all that stuff that I was carrying around as baggage and offload it by putting it into words, I had no idea how to start. I didn't have a, uh, I didn't have a mythos. I didn't have a mythos of women writers to, uh, to grab hold of. Since then, I've discovered that many women have, have had the same problem and they almost always end up in fantasy, uh, children's, uh, mystery, or uh, the one I'm forgetting. Yeah. The Celtic and Arthurian aspects of these books are particularly fascinating and your wonderful gift for world building is on display for the first time. Please share a bit about how you put all these elements together on the page. It became your own unique style with this Maiden series. Talk about writing everything backwards. Hold on. This is what I wrote first. That was my first published book. Uh, let's put it back here where you can see it. Yeah. And uh, I keep on thinking I should shove things right into the camera. And of course I shouldn't. So this was uh, written starting in 1972, published in 1977. And it was released as general fiction, not as fantasy. And at that point I had no agent and I had no training and I had not taken any creative writing courses and I didn't know from nothing. So uh, this was later rewritten completely as The Silver Sun. So The White Heart actually came third. So once I started writing, I wrote compulsively. I wrote, I was, uh, I was a teacher's assistant and I wrote during coffee breaks. I carried the notebook with me wherever I went. It was a handwriting in a spiral bound notebook and eventually clunked out on an old royal typewriter uh, that I, I had to practically hawk myself to get into. It took, it took great effort to actually even get a hold of a typewriter. I was not a rich person. Anyway, uh, so the Silver, I'm sorry, the Book of Sons was first. Hal and Alan were the two heroes. All of these fantasies involved paired teenage male heroes, the princes, princes basically, uh, one of whom was uh, sunny and stable, and the other of whom was brooding, shadowed, tortured, and was basically the self that I was not allowed to have, that I was uh, trying to come to terms with. This was like my yang and yin the me trying to come together as a, as a person. I did not yet realize I was female. All the books I had read growing up were male oriented. Uh, the stuff I read in college was male oriented and I identified with my prince as my, my, fem my male main characters. And I identified with the friendship of males and I was very much influenced by Rudyard Kipling. Another totally, uh, another, uh, misogynistic author, go figure. Conan Doyle was misogynistic too. Basically, I wrote a very oversimplified map of England as it never was. Isle is England. I was an English lit major. What led me into the Celtic stuff was falling in love with the poetry of, w, of, of Yeats, William Butler Yeats, and researching uh, the references in those poetry and then just absolutely diving into research in, in Celtic mythology and all mythology in general. At one point or another, I read The White Goddess. I read The Fraser Golden Bough. I read uh, oh, so much stuff. I should have a, a degree just for all the reference work I, I read on mythology. The, the entire LaRousse Encyclopedia of Mythology. Uh, I never did answer your, your previous question, which is the order the books were written. I wrote uh, 
The Silver Sun Well. I wrote the Book of Suns first. Then I wrote a, a sequel that went nowhere. And then I wrote uh, The White Heart, which was a prequel, took place before the action in the Book of Suns. And then the whole thing came together. Uh, there was a, a long period in there after the publication of the Book of Suns where I was getting nowhere fast. I was having books rejected. I was writing books that weren't quite good enough. I didn't have, my, my first publisher had gone away somewhere and I did not have another publisher or editor, excuse me, editor. And uh, it was very discouraging and a very down time. And then all of a sudden the stars aligned and all, all three books were sold at once. And I was on my way rejoicing. But uh, the, yes, the order in which they were written was the second, the third, and the first. I was pretty much dreaming the same dream over and over. I, I always have the bright man or the sunny man, the shadowed man, uh, or sometimes the shadowed man took the form of a, a creature like uh, Gwern, who was or sort of an earth sun. Or I, I got further and further into the mythology and the whole books improved enormously the more I got into the mythology and the more I got into the fantastic. The first one that I showed you, this, this really is just an adventure written in an imaginary place. I didn't have any authority to set anything in a real place. So I made up an imaginary place and set the adventure there. The fantasy elements aren't there as much as they are later on. Partly because the editors told me, say, hey, you're writing a fantasy, do fantasy. And partly because my own researches into Yates and so forth uh, gave me a much greater enthusiasm for that. And not, partly because there's so much that you can do that way that I, the more I did it, the, the more enamored I became of it. And I continued that way for many, many years still. And for you and your readers, what kind of advice would you share with those among them who are aspiring authors? Of all things to write, I, I would, you know, I started with the mythology and, and wrote the fantasy. So I would, I would say uh, it's similar to what happened in science fiction. Scientists started writing science fiction and then, then other people started writing, writing science fiction based on science fiction. If you write fantasy based on fantasy, it's like inbreeding. It's, it's sort of like the, it gets weaker and weaker and eventually it just sort of peters out. Uh, my advice, not, not just fantasy writers, but to writers in general, is to be professional, be cooperative, be polite, uh, don't be too big headed, but at the same time, make sure you're true to yourself. In other words, sometimes you listen, sometimes you just don't listen. And there have been times when I listened to an editor that I should not have listened to an editor. And then there have been other times when I failed to listen that I should have. Uh, but ultimately, uh, especially with people, they join critique groups and immediately their stuff starts to look as if it was written by a committee. And that's what you don't want. Critique, go, 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 blah, blah, blah. critique groups are good. They're excellent. They are a way for you to go out there and develop your skills of critiquing, um, understanding what goes into writing fiction and understanding what your own values are. But the thing is, you have to find that out for yourself, not listen to the other guys. Uh, they're going through a similar process. They're working on, say, their dialogue. They're having trouble with their dialogue. So they will pick on your dialogue. Don't listen to them. You're having trouble with pacing. So you pick on their pacing. Listen to yourself. The thing is to just open that connection between your head and your hands. People tend to edit themselves so much and they've got such ideas about what's correct and what's not correct and what their English teacher would have said and, and, and what their creative writing teacher would have said and what their editor's gonna say and what their agent's gonna say and is it ever gonna be successful and will anybody ever read it? 
And nobody's ever going to read it if you don't write it. You just have to let it all go. And uh, stop thinking so much. <laughs> just, uh, I, I, one thing I say frequently, and here's one more thing. I frequently tell people it works to play. It works to be in touch with your inner, inner and that was a ball told me around there, yes. Come on, you thing. Toys, play. Buy the colored pencils and pens, buy the crayons, buy the coloring books, or make them, or draw, <laughs> do the pictures and do the paint by numbers and, and the connect the dots. Whatever your child wants, it's up to you to get your child going on your side. I know the phrase inner child is overused, and under-respected, but that's really what it's all about, is just making that connection back. Wonderful tip, thank you. You won your first Edgar for toughing it and the best juvenile novel for looking for Jamie Bridger. What did you most enjoy creatively about those projects and the new directions that you took with them? Well, I have to say what I most enjoyed about them was winning the Edgars and discovering I wrote mystery. <laughs> I had no idea. And after that, after I won those Edgars, I started selling short stories, mystery short stories to Alfred Hitchcock and Ellery Queens. But uh, something it was a difficult book to write. It's uh, based on profound grief. Uh, when I got halfway through it, I started to chicken out and think, who's going to want to read this? It is so heartbreaking. And indeed, I did get one... Uh, review, I think, from Publishers Weekly that they were just absolutely poisonous about how, how, uh, how melodramatic it was and how sad it was. And uh, I, I obviously, it was a good bad review. There are, there are bad reviews and then there are good bad reviews. This, this was one where I had touched somebody's nerves and they got pissed off and they let me have it. And so I'm like, ha, gotcha. Jamie Bridger, um, it, it's based on a, a letter I read in an Ann Landers column, or maybe a Dear Abby, where somebody had a child late in life, woman, and she's saying she's embarrassed, and could she just pass this child off as her granddaughter? Uh, and it was a situation of, I've got to write something right now because I earn my living as a writer and there will be no living if I do not write something right now. So it was really, I didn't even think about it for much more than two days. I went around, walking around the house thinking, what, 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 come on, book, book, book. And I remembered the letter and I came up with Jamie Bridger and I jumped going back around. You were asking about mystery, but what caught my attention and what I really wanted to talk about is why I'm all over the place. And that has to do with my development as a human being. Once I got past the first 10 or 15 fantasy novels, that whole time I was looking inwards, trying to fix me. I was a mess. I was a basically messed up, broken person. I was had an odd childhood. I had an odd adolescence. Uh, and I continued being a very odd person right up until it all crashed in on me. And, uh, and at that point I was writing and it was partly the writing that saved me. It was also some very good therapists. But after I started to get myself together uh, and I was no longer divided in half, yang and yin, then I wanted to turn my vision outward. See, by then I knew how to write. When I started writing, it was for to uh, fix myself. And left the time I got done fixing myself, or I'll, well, I'll never be done, but by the time I more or less managed to fix myself, I loved writing. And I knew how to do writing very, very well. So I went all over the place. Ooh, I want to try this. Ooh, I want to try that. It can be an incredibly transformative experience, that's for sure. And you can go anywhere you want to on the page. Just take I Am Mordred. You won the Carolyn W. Field Award for that. And I'm Morgan Le Fay. Both of those grew out of short stories, correct? The original inspiration for them? Mordred happened because I, okay, I have to novelize things. One day long ago and far away, 
I was paying the bills and the checkbook was not looking good at all. So I phoned Jane Yolen. I had received in the mail, this was back when everything went through the mail. I had received an invitation to write a story for an Arthurian anthology of hers. I think it was called Camelot. And I had not written the story, but I, in, in regard to the checkbook, I phoned Jane Yolen and asked her if she still was open for a story. And she said, no, technically I'm closed, but you know, nobody wrote a story about Mordred. So if you can have one to me within say 10 days, I'd like it. So I walked the dog. It was a little Sheldy dog by the name of Nicholas the Ridiculous. And uh, I walked Nicholas in the rain. And by the time I came back, I had the beginning of the Mordred story. And indeed I wrote it and I got paid and I was glad of it. She accepted it, I got paid. And the next thing that happened was this ed editor, this self-same editor, Michael Green, coming after me. He, he was not yet my editor. He, he had been the editor for the anthology of Jane Yolens, saying, I want a book based on this story. So that's where that came from, down the line, years down the line. And then again with, uh, with uh, Morgan Le Fay, again, it was his idea and I thought he was crazy. And uh, it turned out to be very successful. Turning the spotlight there for a moment, your short story output has remained prolific throughout your entire career, notably with the Hugo and Nebula Award nominations you just recently received for The Boy Who Played at Mains. It was just one example among many. What aspects do you most enjoy about this particular theater of writing? They're a challenge. They're a tremendous challenge. Uh, I've heard it said that most uh, writers are either naturally novel length or naturally short story length. And I think I am more naturally novel length. I believe in things working out over a period of time. Whereas in writing short story, what you have to do is kind of believe in an epiphany where everything gets fixed all at once. And they're harder to write for me because, uh, well, it's like poetry is harder to write than just a journal entry, you know, because every word has to be right there, just right. The Boy Who Played at Mains is probably the best one I've ever written, and it was one of the very early ones. And for about a year or two after that, I couldn't write short stories because I couldn't write them as well as that one. After a while, I had to just accept that. Uh, what happened was I saw a beautiful white horse standing in a dark stable, and something went on upstairs. And uh, even as I was running it off on... Uh, what did I have then? A, a, one of those fan fold printers, you know, old old times fan fold paper. And I'm writing it off and realizing what I did wrong and rewriting it and running it off again. So I, right down to the last minute before I sent it off for publication or in, in search of publication, I was revising it. And I think maybe that's why it's, that's why it's a winner because I, I didn't stop. I just kept on until there was no further to go with it. Well, you then went and successfully reinvented the Robin Hood mythology with the Tales of Rowan Hood series. That starts out with Robin Hood's daughter, Rosemary, who we meet in Outlaw Girl of Sherwood Forest. And then we get to know her in Lion Claw, Outlaw Princess of Sherwood, Wild Boy, and Rowan Hood Returns. Please tell us how that opportunity first came your way. Well, the original inspiration might have been because my editor, Michael Green, took me to lunch in New York City to a very nice French restaurant with cloth napkins. And we were talking about Jane Yolen's uh, anthology, Sherwood. And I offered to write a story for it. And then after that, uh, okay, the, uh, the uh, Jane Yolen had done a previous anthology called Camelot, I think. And I had written a Morgan, Mordred story for that. And it was Michael Green's idea that that should become a book. Then it was Michael Green's idea that I should write uh, I Am Morgan Le Fay. But Rowan Hood was my idea. But it was because Jane Yolen was doing the Sherwood book and because my mind was on that particular track. Anyhow, so um, Rowan Hood, I did the thing of girl dresses as boy to become free, which was so necessary back then. 
in Enola Holmes, I totally rebelled against that. Now, in the movie, they do have her dressing as a boy, and I'm like, oh, well, that's a shortcut. Go ahead. But uh, in, uh, in the books, she takes great pains to create her corset of supplies, ammunition, munitions, and uh, emergency equipment, which becomes her device to escape. Rowan Hood, I think one of the funnest thing about things about Rowan Hood was the dog, the arrow catching dog. I love animal companions. It's so it's a good way to make your human protagonists more human, that to show that they have a soft side, if indeed they are kind of a, a grumpy or uh, injured or wounded or you know kind of a gloomy person to start with. Give them, a, give them an animal. Rowan is a, is a mystic tree. It's a kind of a, a fairy, has, has a supernatural significance in, in English folklore. She has a ring, a, a gimel ring, which is a kind of a puzzle ring. And there are six strands. And I am originally meant to write six books, one for each strand, one for each member of the band. Uh, but that eventually fell through. I simply ran out of Rowan Hoodish energy. And I, uh, it, it was successful, but not all that successful. So the publisher was all too willing to just sort of let it, let it pass with, uh, I think I ended up, yes, there was a character named Bo. I never wrote a book about her. She just wandered in. And there was supposed to be, there was supposed to be one more character, I think. It's kind of an incomplete work. Any favorite books or characters from among those volumes you did complete in the series? Outlaw Princess. Because mom's in a cage and we've got to rescue her. I don't know why so. That's just the one, you know. Um, and and Etard Etty is a, is a wonderful character. And of course, I love Lionel, but he's... Uh, I, re I really shouldn't play favorites. I love them all, but when when somebody, if I have six of the books sitting here and I want to give one out, it's always Outlaw Princess. You took home the Tip Tree Award for Lark on the Wing, which again demonstrated your talent for flying off anywhere into any world you want to in books. What was that ride like in your mind as you were taking it with the story? I enjoy telling the stories about the books. And the story about that one is that there was an editor uh, who I think shall remain nameless a science fiction fantasy editor who at every science fiction convention I went to was uh, taking me out to dinner along with other people, uh, whining me, dining me, and obviously wooing me. And it was kind of a one-sided affair. But again, the checkbook wasn't looking good. The, 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 the ex-checker was not looking good at all. And I did pretty much support my family including uh, my mother and my horse on my earnings as a writer. So it, sometimes things were tight. And now a lot of people think, oh, she had rich husband so she could write. No, it was the other way around. I wrote so that I could get by. Uh, so I was at a convention and for some reason I walked into the bar. I don't usually walk into bars, but I guess I was bored, so I did. And this editor blew smoke in my face and asked me what I was thinking about writing. So I spilled this long, vague thought about doppelgangers. And she said, I'll buy it. Alas, she only offered $3,000, but I needed the $3,000. So I wrote that whole great big lark on the wing thing, all fast in a row, just as it is, without thinking about it, PMSing the whole time, just furious that I had to write this thing and take this measly money. And I handed it into her exactly the way I wrote it without rewriting, without editing, without anything. And she published it exactly the way I handed it into her. And it's just me hanging out all over. We meet the Circle of Twelve in the Hex Witch of Seldom. Do you have any favorite characters from this novel that still pop up in your imagination and say hi once in a while? I do remember Bobby. And of course, I remember the Stallion Shane. And I remember inventing the Hex cards. 
and then having people write to me and saying that their grandmother used to have circular cards like that. And I'm thinking, well, good for grandma. I just invented them. Please tell us about inventing hex cards for a book. That's a first for the show. That's taking the tarot and making it not, not quite so mean. Um, tarot cards are scary. If you deal one upside down, it's deadly. Uh, and I, I forget. Okay, somebody was doing an anthology called Tarot Fantastic. And of course, I had to sell a, a story to it. If anybody did an anthology, I had to sell a story to it. So I had to research Tarot and I had had a Tarot reading and it scared the crap out of me. So I invented my own set of circular tarot cards so that you could not lay them down upside down. And uh, they became hex, hex symbols. And interestingly, that book, um, in the original version of that book, the hardcover, and I guess probably in the paperback, they headed each chapter with a hex sign. And they asked me what hex signs looked like. So I drew a bunch of them and sent them along and they used them. So I illustrated my own book. We've noticed that horses start thematically writing their way into titles, like a horse to love and not on a white horse, and then continue through their all name Wildfire, Skyrider, Colt, The Great Pony Hassle, The Boy on the Black Horse, among others. Was that art imitating life for you? Well, what, what happened there is that finally, when I was, I think, 33 years old, I fulfilled my lifelong dream and I got myself a horse. And I spent the next year probably telling everybody in the world all about my horse until people started to avoid me. <laughs> and, and then I figured it out. And uh, the first book was A Horse to Love. And I was so sick. I had such a bad, bad cold that the only way out was to write about horses. It was the first time I tried writing about horses for children. And that's where it started. And I just sort of kept on. Uh, yeah, the whole reason I started writing for children, actually, I think I was kind of snobby when I first started writing. I was thinking, people were saying, of, of course you write for children. Every, every woman writes for children. I was saying, no, I don't. And uh, well, then I did uh, because of the horse. Skyrider. That's a, a lovely kind of a horse fantasy, supernatural angel horse thing. Angels ride horseback, you know. Your gifts on the page took you into a totally new realm with Apocalypse, where we meet disfigured anchor character Joni Musser. Did she walk right into your mind looking exactly like that? And why was her disfigurement key to the character and broader story that followed? I wrote a previous, an entire novel about that character. I don't remember what it was called. I've written so many novels that weren't published. It's just, I think I've probably written at least as many as are published. I wrote this enormous uh contemporary novel about a writer who gets rich by a disfigured girl who becomes a writer, gets rich, gets plastic surgery, is famous, and ends up bashing her face into a mirror because she just wants people to love her the way she is or was. And my editor at the time, sorry, my agent at the time sent it straight back to me and said, writers don't succeed by writing books about writers. She said, uh, an editor would laugh this right out of the, you know, because editors know that you don't just write a book and get rich and famous. It doesn't happen. Um, so I borrowed Joni Musser from that entire aborted book. But yes, she was extremely important to me. She was key to my uh, figuring myself out. And what happened there is that I had just been writing about her. I went to my then therapist. He asked me, well, if you were to write a suicide note, what would it say? I said, as usual, I can't stand it. I don't want to go there. I don't want to write a suicide note. He said, okay, take a billboard. What would it say? I said, I want attention. He said, no, no, attention's a negative word. What do you really want? I said, I want love. And that's when I realized I wasn't an evil person. I just wanted love. That was why I was kicking up a fuss because I, anyhow, but that was all due to Joni Musser. She had the same progress. All she wanted was love. 
Well, you've certainly gotten plenty of that throughout your career from your readers. It sounds like it's become a big extended family. What's it like when you get to have reunions out on the road or you see old fans that you've known for years or else new ones coming up with a book for you to sign? I'm very happy when I get a letter from somebody saying that I helped them through a dark period in their life. Because really uh, what these books are all about is compassion and consolation. They're all about, hey, reaching out. It's me reaching out and trying to make that connection by the heart. Uh, there are books that come from the heart and then there are other books that come from the head. And I can tell the difference in my own writing. There are times when I just wrote from the head because I had to make ends meet. And then there are books that came straight from the heart. And uh, they're, most of them are good, but the books, the ones that came from the heart are better. So it's, it, the pride is not so much in the legacy as in the, uh, the connection, the connection I've, I've made, connections I've made through the books. With as vivid an imagination as yours and the worlds you've built with it, you've certainly kept illustrators at publishing houses on their toes over the years. How involved do you get with that part of the process? Not up until fairly recently. Up until the Michael Green era, I had no say as to covers, none whatsoever. Uh, I was fortunate as to covers the uh, the, the books of Isle, those Carl Lundgren covers definitely, definitely helped put them into the into the popularity side. The White Heart Puck cover is just gorgeous. It's one of the most beautiful covers I've ever had. And, uh, but no, in general, uh, it's sort of like if you write a picture book, you don't tell the artist what to do. No, generally the covers, they would say, we know best. So it's only more recently since the, I think, I guess publishing has gotten more democratic or something that I've had people asking about me, asking me about my covers. This is the most recent fantasy novel, Oddling Prince. It's from Tachyon. The cover is by Brian Giberson. And I did have some say on that. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. It could be Giberson, but I think it's Giberson. Anyway, um, this is the very most recent fantasy novel in the terms of handsome princes and long ago and far away. This sums it up for my whole lifetime. This is my last final effort in that direction. And it was published not that long ago and written not that long ago. It was just like, okay, I've got one fantasy novel left in me and this is it. It was published in 2018. Wow, that's breaking news for your fantasy fans. Did that change your headspace at all while you were writing it, knowing it might be your last one? It was just that I had one leftover piece of fantasy in me uh, about, uh, again, about two princes, but a variation. And I, I don't want to do a spoiler here. So I'm just telling people that this is out there and this is the last word. Well, we're certainly happy to help spread the word here. Along the same lines, when can fans expect to hear next from Enola? Right now, I'm working on another Enola Holmes book, and I don't dare tell anybody much about what I'm working on, but I just last night wrote what has to be the best line. And uh, we're in a place that is full of dogs, and the dogs are killed, and it has to do with rabies. But Enola is saying, why are you letting this happen? Why are you killing these dogs? And she says, so we can dry their brains. No, it makes no sense. But, but in the context, it will. And it does. I love animals. And I'm so glad to have been able to put a horse, uh, uh, a very, uh, very ill-behaved horse into this last Enola book. Grand Ghost is another new title in your ever prolific catalog that both viewers and fans can get their hands on now, correct? Love the cover. Um, and I didn't have any say to the cover, but I love the cover. Both of these books, uh, Oddling Prince and Grand Ghost, I, were very low money books. Fantasy, by the time I wrote them, fantasy is no longer what it used to be. It's not as attention getting as popular. This one is about, uh, it's about me. It's about a middle-aged woman who has no grandkids. And, but she does end up with a ghost. Actually, she finds a skeleton in her backyard. Rather than being a writer, she is a children's book illustrator. Uh, my mother was an artist. 
So at, very similar to Enola's mother, my mother, my mother, my mother, and yeah, I forgot to say that. Enola's mother, Enola Holmes's mother in the books is very similar to my mother. Enola Holmes's mother in the movie is not at all similar to my mother. With such a consistently rich catalog woven with so many characters and stories you clearly enjoyed writing, when you look through the standalone portion of that library, which is extensive in its own right, are you particularly proud of any titles that stand out? I can tell you which ones I least like. Possessing Jesse. That's the mistake I made when I listened to the editor. The editor wanted me to end it with no hope. I hated that. In the short story that it was based on, there was hope and Jessie was going to get back. But in the book, she's doomed. I listened to the editor and I shouldn't have. Uh, I, I Also, uh, Blind Gods Watching, I never should have insisted on getting that published. That's kind of a mistake book. That one would have been best suppressed. <laughs> but uh, in opposite, uh, My Sister Stalker, I love that book. I just, it's a, a brother and sister book, and I just really like it. I really like Separate Sisters. Oh, Separate Sisters was uh, one of the books. This happens with me fairly often. I know somebody, and I can't solve their problem, so I solve it in a book. One of those sisters was somebody I knew. Uh, another one is uh, Somebody. That was somebody I knew. And, uh, oh, oh my gosh, uh, The Blood Trail. That was based on something that happened. Yeah. And so was Sky Rider. So when something upsets me in real life, I go write a book. Thank you for such candor. Any other news you'd like to share with fans they can look forward to before we go? You know, what's, what's uh, really exciting to me right this very moment in time, and I'll just go ahead and blurt it out. I'm not sure. Uh, the original five books, there's a, a rumor. I'll just say there's a rumor that they are going to come back in paperback. Wow. There's, of course, this book, but then after this one, there will be another one. I'm not sure exactly what the title is. And you asked me at one point how it was coming up with these uh, these titles, Missing Marquess, Black Barouche, uh, Cryptic Crinoline, and all the rest of it. And I'm telling you, I, I said to the editor, why don't we call it the case of the missing Marquess? And I was joking and they said, yes. So now I'm stuck with that. And I'm stuck with the ciphers too, the, uh, all the uh, secret codes and so on. Yes, there will be more Enola. Uh, beyond that, hey, I'm getting old. <laughs> Give me a break here. But uh, I really don't know. I do it. I try to do it one day at a time now. Finally, within the literary realm, after your vast travels, is there anywhere else you still want to go that you haven't yet? Look at list author item. No, honestly, I don't think so. I think I've, I've been there and done that. You certainly have. And in ways, it's important to note that no author had before you. It must feel nice to be so content with that catalog. Yes, I am. I am very content. My life right now, everything's Everybody else was suffering so much during COVID, and I was so lucky to have the movie and my beautiful husband and my beautiful house. And uh, it, I'm just so lucky. I'm very content right where I am right now. Nancy Springer, you deserve to be acknowledged as a true legend and pioneer, and we thank you so much for taking out time today to be with us on About the Authors TV. Thank you so much, Jake.